Kia ora and welcome to our second BizDev at Auckland session for quarter three. As you know, this session has been pre-recorded, so there won't be any live questions today. Now, as many of you probably know, my own professional background is in pharmaceuticals and biotech, so it is a great pleasure today to introduce an old friend, Dr. Just Reinhardt from Bayer. He is currently head of the Cell and Gene Therapy Unit in Boston. So, welcome to the show, Just. Yeah, thank you very much, Guy. Lovely to be here. Thank you very much for your time. I realise it's uh, it's getting later in the evening there in Boston, so thank you very much for for, for taking the time um, to to be with us today. Um, so just just to kick things off, like I like to start every one of these sessions, tell us a bit about um, yourself um, as, as a person and, and, and manager, uh, a bit about your background and career path to where you are today. Okay, yeah, great. I'm happy to do so. So originally I'm from, I'm from Germany. I grew up in what I still think is the prettiest wine area um, in the world, um, the biggest Riesling growing area in the world. But unfortunately, my parents didn't have any wine at home. <laughs> We had two pharmacies, so so I, I thought I'd, I'd study pharmacy. I had an interest in science, and then you know what what happened was essentially I'm I'm I was brought from step to step in my career, always by integrating new perspectives. So once I you know started my studies, it was clear to me that it was the science that I'm interested in. Um, so I engaged into a PhD, went to Heidelberg to the German Cancer Research Center, and worked on on my PhD thesis there. And I really enjoyed collaboration and the applied side of things, so um, which made me entering the industry because I thought that that is where you know ultimately measurable impact of the science ultimately happens. Um, I was offered a great start in the industry, I have to say. I moved to Berlin at that time um, uh, at, to a company called Sharing, um, and they offered me um, an entry point as a as a management trainee. Um, in R&D, so I spent about one and a half years and going through different steps in, in the value chain. I learned lots during that time. And then I spent about five years in R&D until I realized, look, there's more in this, in such a pharmaceutical company. And then I wanted to learn more what happens outside of um, where I was. Um, and that brought me then into, you know, different functions within headquarters. So I did investor relations for a while, but the company then was acquired by Bayer. Um, then I stayed in corporate communication, became chief of staff to the head of the pharmaceutical division. And then in 2010, I realized I need to do something else. Um, I was exposed a lot to the commercial side and I thought, well, wow, that's really exciting. And I thought, um, yeah, why, why don't I, you know, um, engage into learning where the company ultimately runs money. Mm -hmm. And uh, my boss offered me to go to um, Australia to start with. Um, my plan was ultimately to go to New Zealand, but I didn't <laughs> get that far. <laughs> so, so I stayed three years in Australia, um, um, started in the field, um, which was a very important way to learn the business. And then I went from there um, to um, a role to uh, do market access, so to get products um, um, uh, reimbursed um, in the healthcare system in Australia. Um, and three years later, I was offered uh, from there a great opportunity within the company to move to a country leading role. Um, and that brought us back to Europe, we went to, to Poland, to Warsaw, uh, spent three years there. And that's a very dynamic market, um, super exciting. Um, and, uh, you know, after three years in Poland, I was offered to go to the other side of Germany, to France, um, and to lead a more mature market there and one of the biggest markets for us in pharmaceuticals was five years in France um, during the COVID crisis as well, which was a quite quite a unique experience, I would say. Mm -hmm. And then three years ago, we engaged into a new strategy. Maybe we speak some more to that. And that brought me here to the US and I'm now heading the, the cell and gene therapy unit, um, a very exciting field in science. Yeah, and I moved over here with my three um, daughters. Uh, they're seven, 14 and 16, mm -hmm. which is also an adventure we might want to speak about, you know, <laughs> raising, <laughs> raising small children and young adults. Um, <laughs> Traveling the world, um, and I'm I'm married. Um, I like to do sports. Um, I like to be active, explore the world. Um, yeah, and I, I would say that I'm very curious to learn, you know, about what's going on around us. So that's I would say one of my my hobbies, which is a very general way of looking at things. But but I really enjoy life and cool. the adventures that life presents. Great stuff. So talking about ad ad adventures, what are the highlights to date then? You know, what are the things that are the real milestones for you on that, you know, long, um, long career journey at Bayer? Well, during my career, I would say the, 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 the learnings is 
where you know those learnings that were probably not as first glance the most glamorous ones were probably um, those that I integrated the most and because it shows you that you know often things look easy from the outside but then you realize when you're in this um, it, it, it is not always that easy to actually make an impact for example um, managing people I had a lot of experiences with that where I thought well that is um, something where you know the, the, the real life experience makes a big difference and then also one of the things that I enjoyed a lot was to work in different functions because when you work when you're in your silo you always think well why don't you know the others around us don't understand you know what we're doing here and they you know why are they so myopic to certain things and then you move to the next side and you mm -hmm. realize oh wow they have, they have just a different view on things and that you see when you move from for example headquarters to a country that you see when you move from r d to commercial so so that is you know one of i would say the greatest learnings throughout my career um that, that ultimately, you know, moving across, um, getting a broad view on cross-functional work um, is, is probably what I've appreciated the most. That makes a lot of sense. And I think that's probably quite relevant to your current role um, as, as head of the cell and gene therapy unit, because I think as we'll talk about maybe a little bit later, um, there are all mm -hmm. sorts of interesting um, organizational differences and tensions there that having insight into the cross-functional nature of the organization, I would imagine helps a lot. Um, let's go into that in a little bit, but first of all, let's do a bit of scene setting so everyone is on the same page. Could you tell us just yeah. very broadly, um, um, for those who don't know, um, what Bayer is as an organization uh, at, at the yeah, highest level, yeah. you know, very broadly. Yeah, so so we are. Um, <laughs> I don't. I, I don't. I know it's it's not very appealing to say that, but we're a very old company, so we're more than 160 years old. Uh, we started as a chemical company to produce dyes, um, um, coloring dyes. Um, and at that time, you know, quality and, and chemistry was very important and was one of the key key features. And you know, chemistry is also what brought us into pharmaceuticals 125 years ago. We were actually one of the first companies that actually did um, specific synthesis of molecules. Mm. And aspirin, I would say, is one of the hallmarks um, of not only of Bayer but also of the industry because it mm. was one of the first specific modifications that was applied by a chemist to a um, a natural product. And I, I would say it's one once in a lifetime type of you know um, discoveries that we as a company brought forward. Mm. Um, since then, we've evolved a lot. Um, and nowadays, we present ourselves in three businesses. We have um, pharmaceutical business, with, which is essentially um, prescription medicines, so to treat innovative medicines, to treat um, um, diseases. Um, here, we are a, a leading company, for example, in cardiovascular. Um, we are also a leading company in women's health, um, um, in hemophilia, um, uh, also in ophthalmology. Um, and then we have a consumer business, what we call so over-the-counter products. Um, those products are usually, you know, um, known for their brands. Um, aspirin, I already mentioned. There are some others which I'm, I, I'm not even sure whether I'm allowed to mention them here to not do promotion. Uh, but we have some yeah. really, you know, really old-standing brands um, that 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 you know that con a lot of consumers know that that carry a lot of equity, and that are. Um, um, available in you know pharmacies and and supermarkets here in the U.S. And then we have an um, agricultural business, and um, you know we've been critiqued a lot. So we acquired um, Monsanto twenty um, sixteen, um, which is also a very old company because Monsanto has a unique, innovative um, 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 engine, um, you know, producing seeds. And we have an agrochemical business, and that is actually a perfect match. Also, a lot of digital innovation happen in agriculture. And we are now with that leading company actually in, in the agricultural business with about 25% total market share in that business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, that, that's a really nice overview. So now let's sort of dive down into your current role um, as head of the cell and gene therapy unit. Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's relatively new, I believe, um, and it also has a different sort of approach to innovation. So can you tell us a little bit about it, about your role uh, and how it's different to the rest of the Bayer organization, what it's there to achieve? Yeah, I'm very happy to speak about that. It, it, it's, you know, cell and gene therapies in themselves is probably what I would consider the, the most exciting field of the pharmaceutical industry right now and of the biotech industry, because it's really, you know, entering a new um, era of medicine where we, a lot of us hope that we can treat un currently untractable diseases, so diseases which currently don't have a, a, um, a, a cure. Um, 
the underlying technologies um, um, essentially, you know, um, based on genomic medicines. Um, we we do have some products already in the market, not as Bayer, but as as an industry. So we've shown or we've demonstrated, you know, that these um, uh, therapies hold up to their, you know, to their promise. Um, but there's a lot of questions that still need to be um, answered. And Bayer has taken a decision about um, three years ago, four years ago, that we really wanted to enter the field and be all in, because we, we we've seen that there's an innovation curve in the industry. Um, the last, you know, big wave of innovation, you know, the first wave was the small molecules so chemistry, and then you know, that that held us active for about 80, 90 years. And then in the 80s, um, late 80s and early 90s, the wave of biologics came through what we called so antibodies, um, large molecules, biologic molecules, um, which really redefined our industry as well. And um, and, and in that innovation curve, you know, as these things were scaled and people, you know, um, discovered how to master those new technologies, um, we as an industry realized that if you, you know, enter this at an early stage, you will have to invest yourself, but you can do this at relatively low cost and then learn, um, you know, as the innovation goes up um, before ultimately these technologies the expertise in these technologies and to build up so-called platforms becomes very expensive. Mm. Um, and here for cell and gene therapies, we've taken a very conscious decision to go in early as a large pharmaceutical company. We've also taken a decision to go in with a platform approach, so not to acquire individual products, but to say we want to acquire competence around certain technologies. And we said we want to be competent around stem cells. We want to be um, competent around gene therapies. And we've you know, acquired um, certain targets um, in 2019 and 2020. So companies that gave us a nucleus um, to build from. And we've also taken a decision because of the complexity of these technologies that we wanted to, to maintain the acquisition targets or the companies that we acquired, you know, in their integrity to master the technologies. So our current business model is to say, we want to keep those companies at arm's length, as we say, mastering the technology for us, building the nucleus or, or representing the nucleus of innovation. And then we put at their disposition the entire strength of a large scale pharmaceutical company, you know, when it comes to development to scale these technologies into, you know, various markets, geographies, um, to help them with production capabilities, to help them with regulatory capabilities and markets, to help them with clinical operations, you know, to do clinical studies and markets which for a small company is a huge endeavor and very destructive. Mm -hmm. So now we have the best of both worlds. We have the small companies leading innovation, and then we have us um, as a mothership um, helping them and supporting them as we can. And my role is with my, my colleagues to work at that interface to understand both worlds and ultimately, you know, um, manage between those two worlds and ensure that, you know, that the translation actually um, because sometimes we speak different languages um, happens and that we work efficiently together. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of, makes a lot of sense. So so what drove the shift then um, from basically in-house R&D, if you like, you know, um, just, you know, running the discovery labs for small molecules or biologics, but then making a move to say we want to engage in more open innovation. What was the main driver for that? I, 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 I think there's one key driver of it, and that is that you know, when you when you look at a small molecule, um, it's essentially a chemical that has a certain you know biologic activity, and we've learned over the last hundred some years to produce these molecules, to test these molecules, and we have a very you know standardized approach to doing these things that we master, I would say, fully, although not all go as well. But you know, <laughs> yeah. in, in principle, we know, we know we know how these things work, and we know who does what in this in this value chain. When you look at a gene therapy, for example, a gene therapy is composed out of various elements. So, and I don't want to, you know, um, go too much into detail, but but it, it helps to understand the concept. Mm. So essentially what you do is you try to deliver a gene into cells and the gene needs a switch. And what we, the way maybe to explain this is that you, you around that gene, you put like a Trojan horse. Um, usually we work with viruses. Um, and that virus in itself already is represents a very complex technology. Mm. 
And then within that virus, you're transporting a gene plus the switch that actually turns the gene on and off um, in the cells. Um, so we call that a promoter and a transgene. And that in its totality is already requiring a lot of expertise. So we have experts working on the, the, the Trojan horses, you know, to remain at an analogy. We have, um, we have um, experts working on the switches. We have experts understanding the diseases that we're working on. And that is so complex that ultimately we as a company, as one company, cannot master this in its totality. So the way this works nowadays is that we need to network these things. We need to work with academic institutions, with um, clinical experts. We need to partner certain technologies in, in order to make this successful. And that's why we are convinced that we need to open ourselves up as an industry and need to apply different ways of working because ultimately there's not that one single person who knows you know, largely everything about something but you need to bring teams together and always somewhat rely also on external expertise. Yeah, yeah, yeah good stuff. And it, it, it sounds like this was a, a very clear strategically led move from the top to move one into, in, into this particular space, um, cell and gene ther therapies, but also to reorganize part of the business around that uh, and give part of the business almost autonomy to do it. So w was it led from the top? Was this a very clear strategic decision that, that, that Bayer um, you know, um, C-suite um, made? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So I think the principal decision um, was made based on experiences that we've seen prior in the pharmaceutical industry. Mm. Um, because often what we have observed is that a company is being acquired, the company is integrated, the people go, um, ultimately leave, because many of those people that want to work in a small, yeah. You know, very cross-functional environment are not appealed by a hundred thousand people. You know, big system. Yeah. Um, then the people leave, and then the expertise is lost, and ultimately you you lose the entire value. Um, you have IP left, and you know all the the, the infrastructure, but you, you you lose the essential value, which is the expertise of people. And so we've taken a, a very clear decision to say we want to keep the integrity of those companies, those teams to maintain the expertise with, you know, with us. And we've also made a promise to the companies because ultimately it's people that spend their life blood. So for example, in one of those gene therapy companies, there's people who have been in the field for 40 years, they pioneered this and they said, look, I'm, I, I trust you as a company, hmm. but we, 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 what we want from you is not essentially just money. What we want from you is also an opportunity to carry forward from here because ultimately we want to bring medicines to people in need and that sounds that you know a little bit cheesy but it is you know this very yeah. essential mission that they are Absolutely. after they they also want to earn money you know they you know of course everybody you know wants a, a fair value but they were appealed by the fact that we told them we can help you to bring medicines to you know to the world we help you to maintain your teams but we um but we still want to, you know, make sure that we, you know, um, gain certain ownership and, and oversight. So that that's why we made that promise. But then Guy, and I don't want to, you know, become now too, too much going into details, but, but then of course, there's one thing, a high level decision, hmm. but then, you know, the rubber, you know, hmm. hits the road when you get into the weeds of things and you realize about, oh, well, you know, ultimately day to day, this can be yeah. very complicated at work. And that's what we are currently then, you know, trying to, you know, figure out. And we do figure it out over time. We learn uh, on both sides. Um, but, you know, again, it shows that a high level decision doesn't come with a manual, how, how it, uh, you yeah. know, with them ultimately implemented. Yeah. Well, that's really interesting. I, I mean, strategy is really accomplished, isn't it, at, at, at the ground yeah. level? Um, you know, you have very broad guidance from the top in some ways, um, maybe some measures and success factors that, that drive it, but, but ultimately it's delivered um, at the coal face. So let's talk a little bit, a bit about that. I mean, you, you raised an interesting point earlier that your role and the role of your team is really to act uh, as the interface. And I think that, that word comes with um, a lot of meaning attached to it in terms of you actually being the, the there's almost the transition or the the the, the communicative communicative go-between with two very different sorts of um, you know incentive systems so uh, tell us about those tensions as they really affect you on a day-to-day -day basis you know you've got small entrepreneurial um, businesses um, you've got obviously a large 
but by necessity, bureaucratic organization to a degree. Um, how do you manage that interface? What are the challenges you face? And what's the learning, learning journey been for you? A, a lot to unpack there, but I'd love to hear some, some stories. Yeah, so um, t take, a, take a very, um, I would even say quasi trivial example, you know, the, the, the companies, you know, they need a certain infrastructure to, to work forward. Um, they need, you know, electronic laboratory journals, they need access to um, certain, you know, technologies. And, and of course, there's a lot of things that we can help with as a company. Mm. And what you then see on both sides is that, you know, on one side, you have the feeling on, let's say, on the buyer side, for example, a feeling that, um, that the, the smaller companies are not 100% conscious and might not see certain things and don't know to a certain level what they are doing. Um, um, and on the other side, you know, of course, you have huge expertise and they might have good reasons to go with decisions that look from the outside a little bit, you know, different to what the decisions that we might take. Mm. And this paradox on of saying, you know, provide them with freedom in order to make their own decision. But then at times these decisions might lead to inefficiencies because we might already have solutions within the company. That's where we are trying to help. Mm. Um, but often the translation is required because, you know, of course, the, you know, the, the easier access, the easier answer to a question might be, we go with our own solution, we redefine our own, you know, approach, we do it by ourselves. Um, and it takes a little bit of an effort to integrate others and explain, you know, um, what it takes. Um, and for the other side to also go in with the humbleness Mm. you know, to live and to also trust the experience and the expertise on the other side. Mm. Um, and that, that, that is where we are trying to help. And typical examples, um, you know, um, again, are in this, the way that we, that, that we look at systems, processes, infrastructure, but there's also a lot of scientific questions where people in the pharmaceutical industry always think downstream and they would always say, well, to make this a large scale product, we need to think of the requirements of many markets. We need to think about the regulatory requirements. We need to think about so many things because we've been, we've been trying to do this. Yeah. Whereas of course, a small company, they would say, well, we first need to prove that the technology works yeah. and we need to bring it from here to there. And only when we're there, then we can think about all those other questions. And both worlds are right. But to translate that and to make sure that those words talk with each other and find the best of both worlds saying that we we move this quickly from a to b but we still think downstream what might be the implications of what we are doing that is actually then you know the task that we are trying to fulfill yeah and that, and that resonates with what you said earlier about your um your, your cross-functional experience given your history at bayer i'm guessing that um you know the fact you've worked in r d you've worked in many different commercial roles, both at the um, you know, uh, um, corporate level, but also within the region and with, with, with affiliates. So uh, does, does that allow you to help bridge some of these divides in the sense that you understand competing or, 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 or lots of different parties' needs that might be slightly intentional or contradictory? Yes, um, absolutely. I, I would hope so. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I don't say about yeah. me, but um, what, 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 what I do realize or what I did realize over the last 20 plus years is that mostly it from the outside, it looks like a conflict between people, mm. between, between the positions. But when you look at this on a meta level, you do realize mostly it is inherent conflicts of interest between certain options that we have. Mm. Take, that, take that question, for example, you know, if we want to um, check or test the validity of a certain scientific approach, you can do this very quick and fast in a very nimble way and say it works. Or you can already say, yeah, but to make this then, you know, a marketable product, you need to adhere to certain standards. You might want to engage certain potential customers in the future to already create a relation with them. Mm. You might look at, I don't know, bringing this to China and Japan, which increases the, 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 the complexity once more. You, you, you answer to all those questions. and these positions and these options that you always put on the table, they are more a conflict of interest than a conflict of people. And that is something that we are trying to moderate. So to bring it down from a 
personal, let's say, mm. level to opportunities and options where we can decide upon um, yeah. as a company to say, do we want to be fast or broad? Do we want to, you know, um, address one market or all markets? Do we want to prioritize, you know, to go with something that works for some patients or take more time and work on something that might work for more patients? These questions, that that that, that is where we are, we we really benefit from a cross-functional view and a good cross-functional culture to collaborate and really engage into a dialogue to try to understand them themselves. Yeah. Ideally, a team manages between them. Um, and, and I'm guessing it's it's a learning journey because, as you said, there's no there was no textbook for this when the team oh. team started. So, um, is is each case um, uh, is each company almost uh, in, in terms of your role at the interface? Is it almost a, a, a renegotiation every time, or is Bayer as an organisation, or at least the you know the corporate team working with you steering this, is there some learning that's occurring to allow you to bring some of these decisions into a processual kind of arrangement? So you actually have ways that you know work in terms of balancing these tensions, or is each is, is each a totally fresh start? I mean, one thing that I would say we've learned as as a company over the last years is to to, to really to apply certain humbleness in the mm. approach while at the same time being confident that we can, you know, provide value. I would say that for me um, and the people around me, we do appreciate that it is very complex science mm. that these, you know, our colleagues move forward. And this complex science, you know, um, really requires an expertise, which is just outstanding that we respect a lot um, and that we learn to respect. At the same time, we are not, you know, we are conscious of the fact that, you know, at certain times and 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 in certain instances, we can also add value. And to bring this together again with a certain humbleness, and to first and foremost start with a, you know, position of saying, you know, it's the the science and the technology that matters, and only then we can look where we can add value. That 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 I think is something that we've learned over time, um, and where. I would say we've, you know, um, made a big difference. The other thing that we are also learning over time is that still to manage such a model, you need to set certain boundaries because some of the, you know, the freedom that you're providing that, that is mission critical in research in you know, the development of technologies, et cetera. And then you have certain areas where freedom is actually or might be in the inefficient, you know, when it comes, for example, the way you manage the finances in these companies, HR and so forth. No, HR might be, a, uh, sorry, I correct myself. HR might be, you know, mission critical. Um, but there's a lot of, let's say, transactional processes where you feel like, you know, that's where we can set boundaries and, and manage them differently. And we are still in the learning phase. Um, but, but I would say that, you know, um, to find the right balance between freedom and, and guardrails, um, is something that we are trying to, you know, bring forward and, and establish. I, I like the idea of constant learning and that you're also embracing yeah. that. I think that's really, really important. Probably important in a larger Bayer organisation, but, but critical in, in such a unique kind of role. Um, you, you talked a little bit around, um, you know, value being generated. So can we dive to the extent you feel able to, to talk about these things, given any issues of confidentiality, but, but diving oh. into the business model and how value for the, both sides is, is, is created. Um, I think it's quite clear that ultimately this feeds um, innovation, new products, um, in new, in new unmet need um, clinical conditions for, for, for Bayer. So I think there's some clarity there around the future revenue stream. But obviously these are very early stage technologies. So what is the business model so that your, your, your small company partners, um, their, 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 their founders or shareholders or whatever it might be, how they capture value currently uh, and how in the um, immediate or the mid early to mid stage, those sorts of uh, relationships are set up so that they can capture value. I mean, most of the, the, the deals that we've, um, that we've engaged in, you know, they have some type of an upfront payment and then mm -hmm. milestone driven payments. Um, and that I would say overall is also the way that the biotech industry is incentivized by milestones. I mean, most of the mm -hmm. people that move rather than in pharma into a biotech company, they're driven by a mission to move something from A to B. Um, um, it's a very project-driven mindset. Mm. 
purpose, very purposeful. Um, but it's clear to them, you know, what are the next steps that they want to engage in. Whereas, you know, um, an engagement at a pharmaceutical company is much more, I would say, still, you know, um, um, characterized by a, you know, a functional engagement by yearly, you know, um, or monthly revenues that you are, you know, income that you're generating. It's a, it's a different mindset. Yeah. Um, and to that point also, you know, when you, when you engage in partnerships, you need to make clear where's value created. Um, how do you incentivize for that value creation? And then always, even if there's an acquisition, for example, you have a purchase price and then certain, you know, um, um, a, let's say a deferred purchase price by milestones based on, you know, um, certain, um, um, let's say, assets that you want to create. You know? yeah. um, and if it is a partnership, then usually it's an upfront, upfront payment plus milestones where we are engaging in, and these have various forms and, and ways of being structured. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that, that's interesting again. So thinking again about those tensions, um, and the learning experience. Obviously, those kind of arrangements are, 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 are what the biotech um, deal environment has been based on for, for, for many, many years, probably since the 1980s and the rise of biologics in some ways. So, so what are the, what's your experience there around potential tensions when you may have the smaller partner who wants to be more fluid around the value, they, the value track they want to take and the milestones may be for them, may you need to be more fluid. How do you how do you maintain the entrepreneurship and the emergence of innovation whilst having definitive milestones based upon the value you want to achieve on an R and D in an R and D pipeline? Does, does that does that create any any? Is there room for manoeuvre and negotiation there? Yeah, I would say milestones present the same you know benefit and issues as, for example clear KPIs that you measure uh -huh. yep. and overemphasis on certain KPIs. Like when you when you look at the pharmaceutical value chain, for example, and you say you want to produce certain, you know, a, a certain stream of molecules that you move into clinical development and the milestone for us, for us or the KPI is how many molecules do we put into clinical development? Hmm. This has literally no, you know, um, qualitative parameter around it. So mm -hmm. you might move a lot of, you know, bad molecules yeah. into clinical development, but you still meet the KPI. Yeah. And the same milestones. A milestone might be to um, register a product, uh -huh. but doesn't say anything about the quality for the product or to, you know, um, let's, let's move a little bit earlier to prepare a product for uh, clinical development. Um, and, and the fact that you can capture that milestone doesn't necessarily have something to do with the, the underlying quality. Mm. And that's where all the conflict, and I'm not saying in our specific case, but, but in general terms, that's where often the conflict lies. Yeah. That some people, you know, aim towards that milestone independent of the underlying, yeah. or they have a diff, they might have a different view on the quality. Yeah. Um, and others would say, let's, you know, continue a little bit more and make it more robust provide more input, et cetera, and that, you know, um, where, where the quality is uh, up in the forefront of consideration, um, depending on the ownership and the longevity that you assign to the approach that you take. So that, that's where I see yeah. often between in partnerships, a, a key, you know, um, zone of um, controversy. controversy. Yeah, yeah um, absolutely. Yeah. No, that makes, makes absolute sense. And I mean, I, I guess there's no actual Definitive answer to any of these things, but you know, how if if you were to face that tomorrow, how how would you handle it in the in the the two way interface or, or of negotiation between the corporate side and the and the sort of entrepreneurial you know um, partner side? So yeah. it's actually a tough yeah. question. <laughs> no, no, it's, no, it's not. I mean, ultimately, and again, it's. I don't want to appear naive, but. Mm. The majority of the people that we are working with, that I've been working with, uh -huh. really want to create value. Yep. There's very few who are just there to make money or to move something through a certain, you know, trigger point for a payment of something. Yep. The majority really wants to make a difference. They've been, you know, engaging for this for maybe, you know, invested their energy, their life blood into things. Mm. And mostly when you ultimately come down to a dialogue 
onto what ultimately creates the value for patients, what makes a difference, and what is the, let's say, the, the heritage that you are also mm-hmm. able to create scientifically by maybe bringing it half a step further. Usually these are very, you know, constructive conversations. Um, I, I don't want to say that always solves the issues, but ultimately, as long as you remain in dialogue, if yeah. you remain in good contact and unite yourselves around the purpose and the ultimate mission, yeah. then at least you can find compromise um, between, again, for example, speed and, um, and quality. I think that I think you've raised a really really important point there. Um, not forgetting the human side, constant communication, openness, transparency. It, it, it makes a great a great amount of sense. Thanks, thanks, just. Um, let's let's move on to how you organise for this. Uh, um, I, I imagine again, and this is possibly a question to also think about. You know the dynamics of your team, um, how you've learnt and, and, and adapted over time. But can you tell us a little bit how your team's set up and organised? You know what kinds of people are involved? What are their roles? How do you work together to kind of manage this this complex interface? Yeah, so one of the um, the things is that we realized early on, or no, two things that we realized early on. So one is we need to capture in our team an end-to-end view. So we need to understand everything that happens here and that, you know, goes until the very end. Mm. And that implies different technological aspects. So we wanted to understand the science, let's call it research. We wanted to understand how this might be brought to life, so development. We want to understand, you know, I uh, needed somebody to understand how this might be manufactured, um, which in case of those cell and gene therapies is very complex, and then also how these products are commercialized. Yeah. And we also realized that these roles are usually fluid. Um, so there needs to be a very high elasticity in the team. And we realized that given that was a big mission, um, but not every step was defined, that we have to work on very, you know, um, short feedback cycles. Yeah. So what we said is we can't become too big as a team um, managing at the interface. So we said we need to be a team that ultimately can, as a flat hierarchy, work um, with you know the entirety of the team. So we shouldn't be more than 20 or maximum 25 people. Ultimately, we were between 15 and 20. So that whenever we come together, everybody can you know engage into you know dialogue, um, share information, receive information, um, and we can all together keep adjusting on our way. So this one thing was was very important for us. The other thing that was very important is that we have very short feedback loops and 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 cycles in which we adjust. Um, and the third one, um, and I think I said that already earlier, is that we are not too rigid around roles, mm. but that we are that we were clear around tasks. Yep. Um, tasks that need to be fulfilled and we always granted everybody the right to engage in whatever task it was. Um, and you know, to be able to tap into the expertise that was available in the team. And the last thing that I would say is that we always work here on what is our purpose, what is our mission. And this was not something, you know, um, you know, super um, sophisticated, but we just said we want to make this work. Um, you know, we had more, we had, had a bit more sophisticated way of saying it for us. But ultimately, we were clear we want to make two things work. We want to create value by, you know, moving these products um, forward. Um, and we want to make that business model work. And that ultimately constituted for us always, you know, the the, 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 the common zone, the coherent zone of um, unity that we had around us. And that, that I would say, was very, very um, impactful on us. So, so yeah. you know, the, the team's agile uh, and, and flexible um, with those short iterations. How, how also do you sort of incentivize or encourage a, a, a true innovation mindset? You know, you want the you want your team to be able to talk to the, uh, the, the 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 smaller partner firms. You want them to be able to communicate in entrepreneurial ways. How do you, how do you encourage that? I mean, the majority of of, of the team. Um, you know, had, has a very high level of intrinsic motivation mm. to learn. And I wouldn't say everything went well from the first step. So everybody, you know, got a um, bleeding nose at one point in time, uh, <laughs> you know, for saying the wrong thing, for taking yeah. the wrong approach. Yeah. But that's how you learn. And and I would say that in the end, we ultimately all, you know, learned what it means to be at those, at those interfaces. And I would say everybody learned also that at times you need to be oil in the machinery you know, and make sure that the, the, the wheels run and you don't have a specific gestalt in that, mm. um, but you're still important. 
and sometimes you needed to be the fuel um, and the accelerator and making sure that certain things advance because without you know um, I would say you know somebody that takes the lead often things don't work and and that 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 was also for all of us a, a great learning to say that it's not about the persona or your role but it is about tasks jobs um, and ultimately the, the greater mission that you want to accomplish and taking yourself a little bit back and putting you know the as, as stupid as it sounds putting the job you know in the in the center of the consideration i, I would say was it was a key um success factor for all of us and and also contributor yeah um, no, I, I imagine it's quite a quite a good place good team to work with uh, i've known you for a number of years just and i think i've always thought it'd be nice to work for you <laughs> always, <laughs> always very open collaborative good, a good team player so now that sounds that sounds mm -hmm. wonderful let's let's talk a little bit matt now moving away from um how the team is organized to how it operates so um at, at a broader level um how do you decide on um the the companies you want to invest in and, and acquire you know what are the kind of decision criteria obviously involvement in cell and gene therapies is obviously quite important but but what are the other things what are the other drivers of the decisions that, that you make yeah so initially we reviewed not companies but we reviewed um, technologies and we mm -hmm. said we want to engage into um, technologies you know with with as, as our platform technologies we want to have technologies that that are to a certain level mature enough to give us um, confidence that we can create with those platforms, you know, medicines yeah. um, that have a meaningful impact on on you know on diseases and on patients. Um, so the maturity level was important. Then we also asked ourselves to which degree these technologies were scalable. Um, so can you ultimately make this you know accessible for broader patient populations? Um, we asked ourselves questions like you know are they um, uh, accessible. Um, so, is there targets, and that brought us then into you know further consideration on what might be potential acquisition targets, what might be potential ways of integrating those technologies in house. Um, I would also say that after those initial steps to go through acquisition, to defining our strategy, go through the acquisitions, we are now in a phase that we try to solidify you know those three platforms that we have mm -hmm. you know uh, one again is on the stealth therapies one is on gene therapies one is on gene editing um and then you know we complement the technologies while we go mm -hmm. so now we are in a phase where we say what is missing here what is missing there mm -hmm. and and that is actually you know also a lot of fun because you realize that there's a lot of small companies out there that can help us and complementing with their specific approaches, you know, the things that we are doing. Um, mm. and that, that is now becoming then more and more network um, of what we have in our hand. Yeah. Uh, when you're starting then to, to fill in those gaps, you're, I mean, you, you, could, you might think that you're starting to fragment the relationships. Um, how do you start to bring them together so that functionally those gaps are being filled through lots of disparate small um, teams, uh, if you see what I mean? Yeah, so the accountability for a partnership always needs to be clear. So right. you can't make, for example, when you have a three partite um, um, uh, collaboration, it's important that it's clear where's the lead for the overall collaboration. Mm. And, it doesn't, and it's not a vertical relationship. You know, sometimes it's this who, who, who leads this is, you know, um, seen on top of things. That, that's not necessarily the way we look at it. Mm -hmm. But somebody needs to, you know, have the steering wheel in the hand and make sure that, you know, some, somehow we follow a certain direction. And if you have too many, you know, there's this old saying, you know, the, the, the donkey in the village that belongs to the village is, you know, never get something to eat because everybody thinks somebody else will take care. Yeah. So I do think that, you know, also collaborations need need caretaking um, functions, caretaking people and, and need to have a clear accountability. Um, yeah, I would say that that to me is... And is, is that someone from your team who project manages the collaboration then? Or is it someone from... No, my team. No, we are now, you know, we're now in a phase that I would say we are involved in many things, but we are more and more, it, it has been more than two years, we're more and more operationalizing things. So we have in a lot of partnerships, we have our colleagues of Alliance Management and BDNL engaged. Um, in others, um, we have people from R&D engaged. It really mm. depends. And I think to, to remain elastic and, you know, open and saying it doesn't matter 
where the job is done or by whom the job is done as long as it is done in a proper way that actually is a big success factor because otherwise you're having these typical sandpit games of you know whose shovel is it and you know you discuss more around you know ownership than ultimately doing things and so we 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 try to create an environment in it in which we no matter who does it we we will appreciate it and embrace it yeah now that makes sense so, so so not just being the interface anymore, but you're now also helping to plug these partner organizations into different parts of the larger Bayer organization to create that sort of larger network. Is that is that right? Yeah, correct. I mean, right. ideally, at one point in time, uh, you know, and I don't want to say what is the right point in time, but <laughs> yeah. I, we, we make ourselves to certain little redundant because you know, when we, we started all of this, there was a lot of skepticism on both sides. Mm -hmm. And the more you have collaboration, the more you're not integrating these companies because we keep them at arm's length, but the more you're integrating, you know, partnerships, you're integrating relations, you're building trust, confidence. And then over time, you know, more and more those skepticism goes away. Um, and there's a certain, you know, cultural, um, cultural interface where you know the connectivity between the two companies is just strong enough at least that's my vision and my yeah. hope at one point in time we're just not you're not not needed anymore yeah, yeah. so 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 give it give, given the fact you are sort of transitioning some of those relationships you have with those external well th th those those partner companies into the larger organization um how do you kind of manage the, the 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 complexity of that kind of portfolio if you're losing losing those relationships if there's a need to then plug something else into it how do you stay connected with those parts of the bear organization to give you oversight of all that uh, or is that something that really is less important as you as you, as you you know systematize these things and yeah, no, that, that's a that's a that's a great question, guy, and that's yeah. the phase where we're currently in. And I right. always say we are currently in that that last phase where we require a bit of hypercare. Yeah, because we, we're we're you know I think we are operationalizing as to the degree that the people find themselves, and many people know how to find themselves, but sometimes mm. they just don't. And we are in a phase where if we if we if we as a company we are trying to somehow normalize and you know systematically approach those relations then we would have a zillion different models mm, yeah. you know somebody might say we need a contract somebody else might say well it's enough if we write an email somebody says i'm writing my hours to your cost center the next one does something else you know we would have so many different models that somehow we need to keep some consistency mm. but also there usually what happens in large organization is that you train you know <laughs> you train the system yeah and then I would say that after a while, call it a year or two, you know, there's enough knowledge and um, learning in the organization that the people teach themselves. But that that phase needs to be accompanied. Um, yeah. Yeah, constant learning learning journey. Um, I almost want to come back and talk to you again in a year's time to see what, what the next phase uh, has, has, has realized. That's, that's really great. <laughs> yeah, oh, great insights, Just let's, let's move on to um, a slightly different area now. Um, um, one, one of the things that you know, we're covering this quarter with the students is, is, is how you incorporate sustainability into value chains, into strategy, into innovation practices. Um, you know, what, what, what are Bayer's larger um, thoughts on, on sustainability? Uh, and I mean that very, very broadly. Um, so sustainability in terms of um, environmental impact, but also uh, social impact and making sure work itself is, is sustainable. Yeah, that is a great question. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, you know, although I'm not an expert in this, um, I, I think, you know, we at Bayer, we take this very seriously because we've, you know, we've been criticized a lot um, for, you know, various reasons um, because of the industries that we work in, mm. you know, both in the pharmaceutical industry as well as in agriculture or, in, you know, and, and agro agrochemicals. There's a lot of criticism for us as an industry. And I think we've taken a very conscious decision um, also in the wake of, you know, um, backlash that we've seen in the last years to say we need to change and we need to create a model in which we are not, you know, just responding in a defensive way to these things, but we need to drive our own agenda and really incorporate and integrate, you know, um, our role as a company um, going forward. Mm. Uh, and we have, 
you know, um, I think defined a sustainability agenda some years ago that keeps to constantly be reinfined that is clearly integrated in our business strategy because you can't let, let that live next to, you know, the business strategy. Mm. I think those days when you had it, you know, coexist where this was like a little function somewhere, you know, um, in, you know, in one part of the board areas, uh, those days are gone. You need to make it part of your, um, your overall strategy. And for us, you know, we have um, certain um, um, uh, objectives and goals around um, things like climate change. So I think we're one of the first companies that actually said that we want to be climate neutral um, or carbon dioxide neutral by 2030. Um, in the German context, I think we're one of the first companies. And then we have co division individual sustainability targets, um, some very large targets, for example, that we want to help 100 million um, farmers um you know small scale farmers to move out of poverty um um and you know to give them a different perspective on on on, on, on the way they can operate hmm. um or to provide 100 million women with you know uh, family planning um options in the pharmaceutical fields or to bring 100 million families you know um opportunities in self-care and, and these are you know just very high level numbers which underneath have a lot of you know programs where we constantly measure success and then beyond that, of course, you know, we also see that, you know, to make ourselves following, for example, that carbon dioxide um, objective, mm -hmm. we need to constant monitor in the products that we bring to market, are they actually following suit? So mm -hmm. in particular, in our agriculture business, where I'm not an expert, but I understand that in all the decisions in, you know, R&D, for example, they always engage also into conversations um, and, and discussions around do we do these products help us to meet the goals that we set ourselves and can they actually make a contribution and do they fit the criteria that we set ourselves and and i really think that you know we have this mission science for a better life and i don't want to do a promotion here but uh, but but being part of that organization i can really say that this approach to say science can you know yield us with great solutions and can make a big difference um, that is something that is really driving the majority of this organization that I'm, I'm working with. And in, in, in pharmaceuticals, it's obvious, but also in, in the agricultural business, I do think that at this interface of digital innovation of, mm -hmm. you know, farming technologies, but also of, you know, new ways of doing farming, mm -hmm. there is so much opportunity when it comes to mastering, you know, um, emissions, mastering, you know, also the, the, the utilization of pesticides, etc. that I, I really think we need to take a, take an important role in that. Um, yeah, it's a fascinating, fascinating field that where we, where we shouldn't, and I, I would also, you know, your, your, your listeners here, the students, I would really love to see young people engaging there and seeing the opportunity that the technology provides. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that also a large company, the difference a large company can make. You can always be cynical about large companies. We are for profit, not, you know, and all companies are for profit, or most companies are for profit. Um, but still, you, 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 companies can make a positive difference, and I think we, we, we should strive for that. Yeah. That's a that's a great message, Jos. Thanks. And um, just picking up on one one of those threads to to take us into maybe some of the closing questions. We're into the last ten minutes or so now. Um, you mentioned digital, uh, and obviously um, it's something that we touch on in the uh, business masters of business development program a lot. Uh, and and various speakers from. BizDev at Auckland have spoken about um, digital. Um, my, my own awareness of, of, of Bayer, just from my public knowledge, my awareness of pharmaceuticals suggests that digital is becoming huge. Maybe, maybe it's a bit behind other industries. I, I see that all the time, but I don't think so in research. I think in R&D, um, um, pharmaceuticals, uh, biotech is kind of ahead of the game to some ex extent. So I'd love to hear more about how digital is being incorporated into R&D at Bayer and particularly, you know, the companies you're working with as well. Um, particularly in, in such an innovative therapeutic area as cell and gene therapy, the idea that AI and other digital tools are being applied to optimise or accelerate or fine tune um, research in that area. It'd be interesting to, to hear your thoughts. Yeah, so um, digital is massively important. Mm. And, and here we're not talking about apps, uh, you know, um, about mm. the fancy, you know, consumer, you know, um, convenience type of things. Um, that, that ease our days every day, but we are talking about just mastering masses of data. Yeah. 
um, that that is so critical because if you look at the you know the human genome for example um, and a lot of the diseases that we are treating, um, you know, are associated with, you know, um, genetic defects. There's such an amount of data um, in that in itself mm. um, that is, you know, already a good illustration of, you know, um, the, the challenges that we have uh, ahead of us. And then when, when when I look at our industry, I can see that the impact that, you know, data management, data science, um, AI has is across the value chain. Mm. So you look at research, for example, there's a lot of predictive modeling going on. So what might be a good molecule to fit into a certain pocket um, of, a, of an enzyme? What might be the right way of composing, you know, the viral vectors that I spoken about? We work on the promoted the switches that I talked about. Um, for the cell therapies, um, AI also can play um, a, a massively uh, important role when it comes to differentiating cells, imaging cells. Um, and then, you know, you move across the value chain um, in development, for example, the, the way that we analyze data becomes increasingly personalized um, um, and we um, increasingly become um, sensitive to, you know, the fact that we might learn, you know, while we go, um, things that wouldn't be obvious in, in, at first glance, and you know, such exploratory analysis yield huge opportunity. And then also in product supply, you know, the production processes for these um, compounded technologies are very, very complex. And I think that a, that a machine can always, you know, um, provide us opportunity to learn. And even when it comes to Things like you know commercial and marketing these products. Mm. You need nowadays. You need ways of maneuvering through the complex supply chains that we have, making sure these products are at the right time point at the right patient, and then altering learning you know back from you know the patient data, um, and ensuring that we, for example, um, you know um, uh, get coverage for these products. So get these products only paid when they are functioning, and also their you know digital methods can play an important mm. role. So it's 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 everywhere in the industry yeah. and um, yeah. I, and I, 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 I've, I've just, I've just, just reading some of the uh, annual reports from Bayer. It's clear that it's being taken very seriously from the very highest levels of the organisation. Yeah. And, uh, and, and you know, what I hear about the industry generally is it's, it's, a, it's, it's almost a, a competition now is almost based upon um, access to or ability to leverage digital digital technologies, isn't it? And AI to Absolutely. to do these things. Yeah, big changes. Yeah. 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 yeah no, uh, f f final question: um, How do you stay on top of this? And I don't just mean you personally, but but partly you and your team, because you know you have a very specific focus in a very fast-moving, um, uncertain area of technology. But but Bayer generally, how do you stay on top of all these trends? How, how do you see the what's happening? What's coming out of the universities? What's coming out of um, Silicon Valley startups that may affect your business? It's a complex, complex, rapidly changing environment, isn't it? To stay on top of. Yeah, I think I think you need a certain um, how do you call it swarm intelligence. You mm. know the fish how do you call the fish groups. Um, okay. Yeah. You know. Nice. Um, and, and to somewhat, you know, that everybody knows where their position is, but that the thing moves, you know, somewhat at the same time in a certain, you know, maybe changing gestalt. Um, what is important for us is that we have that we are clear on different ways of integrating innovation yeah. and that everybody knows their role. And just to be a little bit more specific. You know, we, we, we do have a business strategy, for example, as I said earlier, we, we have these platforms integrated and we run certain, you know, technologies forward in, in development. We need to integrate certain aspects, you know, um, new, new technologies. And th these decisions we make as part of our business strategy. Mm. But then, of course, we, we, we also have, you know, a wide array of technologies out there where we ask ourselves all the time, where do we invest? What do we go into? What can we, you know, make part of our business strategy and whatnot? And here it's important that we also work with different ways of integrating um, um, new technologies. And we, for example, we have a venture investment arm uh, where we say we just take a stake in the company and let's call it um, for us, that's a foot in the door to make sure that, mm. you know, um, we, we, we engage. And if it goes well, great. Um, if it doesn't go well, well, we have, um, you know, um, 
different investments and 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 and, and our colleagues are very competent so it, overall it, it usually goes well um, but we also have to then discount you know um, some of those engagements but in in the majority it, it provides us a foot in the door and then we do collaborate uh, um, work in certain geographies where we invite small companies to work with us very early on academic you know small groups and that is also for us a way of maybe not getting the foot in the door, but getting a you know one of the toes into the door, in 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 order to really make sure that we as a company keep engaged in you know upstream relevant technologies, mm. but we do that stage gate appropriate. So yeah. early technology, again, we we take a little stake in them um, by you know collaborating, for example, or by making them part of our collaborator ecosystem, you know then. We have the venture investments, and then once we say we we need this, we make it part of our business strategy. Correct. And that, and, and that again, that that we need to work overall with all the colleagues that do these things, and making sure that ultimately, you know, the 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 group of fish um, <laughs> remains. Together. Yeah, it remains in one tight cohesive group. That's great. No, no, yes, thank you so much for that. We'll 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 close that there. Um, thank you for taking the time out of your evening to, to be with us today. Um, there's some really great insights around innovation, uh, particularly open innovation in, in, in a large corporate environment. So that was that was quite unique. Um, please pass on my best regards to your family and um, we'll, we'll leave thank it you. there. Um, th thanks to all the students out there. I know you're watching this after the fact, um, so sorry you couldn't uh, be around for, for questions, but I hope you enjoyed it. Um, please keep up the great discussion boards. I saw some really, really interesting discussions um, on the Canvas boards the other day, so it's clearly absorbing a lot of information and starting to apply it and think, think about how it, um, it fits into your own work. So thank you very much, to, much and I look forward to seeing you um, in a few weeks' time. Take care.